for The Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. Visit us online at faith.yale.edu. This episode was made possible in part by the generous support of the Tyndale House Foundation. For more information, visit tyndale.foundation. I think being not afraid is the, is the call, but the fear is so gripping at the moment. This is not the end. It's not the arrival of the secular age. It's a new phase in the um, realization and penetration of the Christian faith into the world in which we, in which we live. There are all sorts of ways in which Christ and the love of God is present in the society. This space is being filled with the, the Christian message in, in, in different forms. This is not the end of a story. This is For the Life of the World, a podcast about seeking and living a life worthy of our humanity. I'm Ryan McAnally Lins with the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. The human world today is not the same as it was 300 years ago. Far from it. Technology, economics, politics, art, culture, all have seen transformations, even revolutions around the globe. 30 years ago, a triumphalist narrative of these changes was in vogue. Modernity, it was said, had solved humanity's perennial problems, broken through our narrow-minded ethical traditions, and set us towards a future of comfort and perpetual peace after in Francis Fukuyama's phrase, the end of history. Even three years ago, we thought the world was different. I mean, I did. No wonder so many of us are trying to understand the revolutions and mechanics of human society. If you're paying attention, you're driven to understand. And so columnists and talking heads, academics and public intellectuals, not to mention your radicalized high school friend on Facebook, we all have these theories about ideal human society and culture and how the hell we wound up here. Unfortunately, our desire to know and understand often, I mean, usually, exceeds our abilities to perceive and explain. Our guest for the next two episodes of For the Life of the World is Charles Taylor. He sees human life and action not as something to be explained, but to be elucidated, lived with, made sense of together. Over seven decades, he's produced an astonishing and magisterial body of work spanning social theory, religion, epistemology, history, politics, the self, aesthetics, science, technology, and more. But you might be surprised to know that 30 years ago, he described himself as a monomaniac. He meant that his ultimate concern is really singular. It's human life. The one issue that motivates his entire body of work is what he calls philosophical anthropology. But answering the questions of what human persons are and what it means to live a life worthy of that humanity, he says, requires thinking along the borders and intersections of the massive diversity of human society, culture, and thought. He has a long history of political engagement as well. As an undergraduate at Oxford in 1955, he launched one of the first campaigns to ban nuclear weapons. During the 60s, he ran several times for Canadian Parliament as a major party candidate, but fell short by a small margin each time. The result for us, of course, is gratitude for the incredible body of work that came in the wake of his attempts to gain office, including sources of the self, the ethics of authenticity, the secular age, the language animal, all the way up to his 2020 book, Reconstructing Democracy, How Citizens Are Building from the Ground Up. Taylor graciously joined Miroslav and me this summer for a long conversation about what's gone wrong with our democracies and finding common moral understanding. We cover a lot of ground, discussing Christian nationalism, authoritarian government, the future viability of Christian faith and practice, the chaos of the post-truth epistemic crisis that's rampant in political dialogue today, the role of social media in that crisis, and Taylor's most recent thinking about the growth of common ethical understanding in a world that often fails to live up to shared moral principles of respect, dignity, and care. We'll run this conversation in two parts, this week and next. Special thanks goes to many of you listeners and friends who responded with thoughtful and important questions. Those questions help to frame this conversation. 
Thanks for listening. Charles Miroslav, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, it's it's really quite an honor to be able to have a conversation with two of my great intellectual influences here at the same time. Yes, oh, yes. I'm, I'm very, very happy to join in this discussion. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Charles, I wanted to start by asking you a little bit about how you came to the topics that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, you came to philosophy, at least in part, by way of political engagement, I understand. Mm, yeah. And you've been observing, theorizing, commenting on the condition of democratic societies for over two thirds of a century now. And I wanted to ask, why have you invested so much energy in these questions? Why does the question of democracy and its its prospects and the conditions of possibility of democracy, why do those questions matter to you? I haven't got really an explanation, except that I've always been engaged in politics. I come from a family where there's a lot of engagement in politics. So I began off with a predilection in that direction. And then I developed a politics which was sort of of the social democratic left. And I've been working within that ever since. And of course, I've been very dissatisfied with the way things were going in, in all the democracies that I saw around me. And then, on top of all that, came along this present wave of what people call populist, I think it's not the right term, in which two things are coming about, a tremendous uh, scapegoating and attacking of minorities or various people who are judged not to be really fully members of the society on one hand and spreading in an extraordinary way, a way that you can't fully understand because it's happening in India, it's happening in Europe and so on. And the great difficulty of rectifying this because we're getting to a time when, as people say, truth doesn't matter. <laughs> or rather, the conception of truth is deeply split and people live completely uh, wrapped into echo chambers where they can't be reached. So this, the concern about social democracy turned into a concern about democratic politics <laughs> as a whole and reaches a kind of paroxysmic level at this point. That's a little bit the, the quick story. Charles, uh, talking back to your interest in uh, uh, politics, you mentioned your family background and so forth. I was wondering what role did Vatican II, and in particular that revolutionary document of the Vatican II, which is uh, on freedom of religion, I mean, did that play also any role in your own uh, political thinking at that time? Or how did you receive that uh, at the time? Well, it played a tremendous role. It was a tremendous liberation. But I was in a peculiar historical situation of being very, having read a lot and being totally convinced by the theology that made Vatican II before Vatican II ever happened under Pius XII. That's because the theology of Vatican II is so largely French speaking, I mean, French, <laughs> written in French, Congar, or the Dubac, and so on. And the, it was the Dominicans and the Jesuits who were the main trailblazers here. And there was a very intimate contact between the French Dominicans and the Quebecois Dominicans, French Jesuits, Quebecois Jesuits. So we had I mean, sort of young people already, in my case, in total rebellion against the very claustrophobic Catholic Church in Quebec, right? Um, so that I could easily have been one of those people that stepped out and never put foot back in it which perhaps the majority of Quebec society turned out to be. But luckily, I came across this version of what Christianity was all about, and I was very deeply convinced by it. But I thought, hmm. I read, uh, you know, Mounier was also very important, but Mounier and Esprit, right? And uh, Mounier had this wonderful book, Feu la Chrétienté, the, the late Christendom, in which he foretold, the collapse of Christendom as a kind of total society where everybody believed. And he said the real sort of centers of church life are not anywhere on a map. You don't look on a map. The way you could look on a map of confessions and this country would be Catholic with one color and that kind of country would be Protestant with another color. So I thought of it as a kind of almost underground movement. Mm. And particularly with Pius XII, it was perhaps one of the worst examples of that. And then suddenly, the whole thing collapsed in a totally surprising way. 
by the action. And this, you know, this happened to us in, in, in the end several times in the 20th century of the Catholic Church, a succession of a new pope who just uh, put in train certain uh, operations which ended up dismantling that group. Uh, and there's still a very strong resistance in the Catholic Church, as you, we all know, against this. But it was, if you like, a, it was somebody who didn't dare dream of Vatican II <laughs> before it, it actually happened, but therefore was you know, just tremendously energized himself by the fact that it did happen. Hmm. But it's a very, very peculiar situation, and I'm you know, very lucky to have been and I could easily have been somewhere else where I would never have heard of these people, of Conga, of Iraq, and the rest. The, the, this was an extraordinary generation of uh, Catholic intellectuals. Yes. And maybe since we are since we are talking about uh, a democracy and travails of, of democracy, would you mind commenting about some of the more recent uh, developments that want to take the whole development of Vatican II uh, back, in particular on the issue of religious freedom? Uh, a certain form of integralism uh, is now resurfacing in Catholic uh, circles, uh, centered around taking back uh, the idea of religious freedom and returning back uh, Christendom. Uh, and you have similar parallel movements that are happening within Protestantism, like Dominionism, yeah. a variety of uh, groups. Would, would, you, would you comment on this uh, a bit? Yeah, well, th I think that, I mean, it's happening, but I think we, we are, should never be surprised. It's not. It's quite inevitable for a while. After all, we lived from, this is an exaggeration, but <laughs> some broad strokes, from Constantine on, we, we European and European-originating Christians of any denomination, lived with this ideal of Christendom. That is, society, which has not only got a lot of people of the, in the church, but where the whole society is sort of made on a model, its politics, its art, its architecture, everything is made, modeled on, the Christian faith. It's a kind of total environment. And I, I'm not uh, knocking it totally as such because, you know, Divine Comedy and Charles Cathedral, these are not uh, unimportant realizations. But in my view, which is very much concerned with historical change, that becomes a straitjacket for uh, the spiritual growth of the Christian faith. And so we get what I present age, my version of the secular age, which is the growth of more and more people who are seeking, uh, who are trying to find new paths, new spiritualities, basing themselves on very profound personal experiences and so on. There's bound to be a reaction because there was a certain standard view of history which we had in the Constantinian Christian Church. First of all, this society goes all Christian, then it sends up missionaries, and that society goes all Christian, et cetera, et cetera. Now, it's been frustrated by Islam and other kinds of obstacles, but the idea, the ultimate idea of the parousia was that everybody becomes a Christian, and that's, <clears throat> and that's, I'm a bit exaggerated here, but and that's the, that's the telos of his history. So when you think that's the telos of history, and then suddenly it goes in reverse gear, and lots of people are leaving church, and et cetera, et cetera, you panic. If that's your, if you're still stuck in that chrétienté, which is the French word for Christendom, not, not Christianity, but Christendom, right? So it was just inevitable that this should, should happen. And it's, uh, I think you can see perhaps beyond the present day when we'll perhaps get over it. Some of that, or the people are still stuck in that and get over it. Now, the history of pontificates in the Catholic Church is interesting since then because uh, all the people who succeeded Vatican II took in a great deal of it, but there was always resistance. There was some resistance on the part of John Paul II, but he did wonderful things at the same time. I mean, I feel very you know, divided about him because he did wonderful things like apologizing to the Orthodox for what we did in the past. I mean, the sense that we've done some terrible things. At the yeah. same time, I think he held on to much too rigid and narrow a sexual ethic, and, and uh, he couldn't stand Marxism in any form. So, 
and so there were there were limitations. And then we get another great breath of fresh air with uh, Francis, who I think is very much in line with how I feel the future of the church and God. You stop worrying about defending what exists there, and you reach out and just be a Christian, right? which means reaching out, and that is what it's all about. This emergence of integralist forms of uh, Catholic political thought, uh, uh, yeah. uh, it was always there as a kind of marginal, uh, a marginal movement, except that right now it's coming at a moment where we have a sense that democracy is in crisis in many areas uh, of the world, um, that it's in crisis in the West in terms of its its motivation, whether that comes from Silicon uh, Valley uh, or from uh, from other sources. But democracy itself, there's a sense something's wrong about it. Uh, it's not quite functioning as it ought to be uh, functioning. And then this mm-hmm presents itself as uh, a, a Christian alternative uh, rooted deeply in the Christian Christian tradition to uh, to that to that crisis how do you respond to that well I mean I'm really horrified by the inability of all these intergross movements to keep themselves separate from the worst elements of the present rebellion against what I consider healthy democracy I mean take the American scene the all great deal of these integralist movements are voting for Trump. For Trump is just such a, it would be laughable if it weren't cryable if it make you burst into tears. These, so uh, it's, it's, <laughs> these people are in a sense, in the long run, condemning themselves. They're doing something to the Christian faith, which will turn you know, future generations off in, in the most, I think, powerful way. <clears throat> I mean, they have they always seem to end up in the, on the side of the... I mean, there's something similar happening in France with certain kinds of very integrous Catholicism, which Marine Le Pen is appealing to, and there the vehicle is bashing Muslims and so on. And <clears throat> so this is not an exciting new development in history. This is not something that will end up exciting future generations and who are dying to join this. Uh, <clears throat> this is very much a, a dead end. But it, it is a threat. I mean, it's certainly a threat. <laughs> you know, the, the Trump almost pulled off a coup d'etat, and that would not be very, that would be just so catastrophic for the Western democratic world that I don't even want to <laughs> consider it too much. So it's, it's not as though we're saved from terrible historical uh, deviations which have real, maybe really powerful effect on people's lives. But we have something which is spiritually, I think, very, very dead in the end. If it, you know, it can't separate itself from this, uh, how can it go on defending itself? From- <clears throat> hmm. So, so I think we've been kind of sharing and presupposing uh, what I think is a widespread sense that democracies worldwide aren't in particularly good shape. Yeah. And I, I was wondering if we might step back and, and kind of take a take a panoramic view and you each might offer a little bit of your mm. of your diagnosis of uh, in what respects are they not in very good shape and and what are, what's underlying that? How did we get to that situation? Mm. Well, I'm a bit puzzled to talk on a general level because I find countries with very different backgrounds are going the same way. But but there is a common pattern in, let's say, Western democratic, so North Atlantic, including Australia, <laughs> North Atlantic, you know, that kind of society. And that is the development <laughs> for a long time, after a period of social democracy at the, you know, at the end of the war and starting even earlier in the U.S. with the New Deal, there was a period of drift away from that, an acceptance of an easy kind of neoliberalism that Distribution takes care of itself if you just you know, <clears throat> allow maximum production by getting rid of obstacles. And also a certain kind of elitism in which people just ignore the running down of public services on one hand and the steady decline in the standard of living of many workers on the other. 
So in a certain sense, a lot of suffering people were open to being appealed to by a very terrible kind of demagoguery, which in the American case takes the it takes the form of Trump and France of Le Pen and Salvini and Italy. I mean, you can go through the the whole range. But then this is not a world explanation. Why did India I still horrified at that, which started the Republic started off under the aegis of the Gandhi Nehru view of a richly plural society with a deep mutual respect between the different faiths, why did it suddenly mutate into this horror under Modi where they passed a law that you know, refugees or Muslims can't become citizens, but refugees who are Hindus can, and one goes on and on. Why did, in certain other cases, you see democratic movements like the one in Turkey sliding into um, quasi-dictatorships. And so you get a kind of pattern covering Orban in Hungary, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, and so on, where you, where Democrat, in the Polish case very clearly, they, they try to build a facade democracy which has built in irreversibility in it. So the, the structure is such that the power can never be overturned, but it keeps up the appearances of democracy. And in the case, Russia is another kind of case, but the, the, the thuggery is so evident that it's not very well, not as very well concealed in, in Russia. So that's, that's another pattern. Uh, if you put all these patterns together, you might easily think that uh, democracy just is a non-functional system. And I know that some people do think that. And I very much resist that. And it could just be that I'm sort of hopelessly optimistic, uh, you know, in my <laughs> deep wellsprings of my of my life, and uh, I am unable to see this impossibility, <laughs> which is clearly being demonstrated. Uh, you know, but I, I persist in thinking that you've got to fight this out. But I am perplexed at the way in which all sorts of forces are combining to discredit democracy in this way. Uh, so, so uh, I was going to build on, on something, Charles, that you sent us, uh, describing uh, what's necessary for democracies to function well is a kind of, uh, you said it was a kind of common sense of identity as a people so that they can uh, identify with the larger project, but also something like the, uh, uh, the universal principles yeah. on the basis of which it, it functions. And the, my question to you would be, are, are we seeing um, a kind of erosion of both of these uh, uh, essential elements of democracy uh, today in, in Western, say, American uh, society? I mean, there are hyper strong common identities that mm -hmm. are not common, but they're particular uh, group identities on the one side or on the other side that there is a kind of... Uh, constant problem uh, of Western democracies, that is to say individualism, inability to actually project oneself and see see the whole. That's kind of on the one side. But on the other side, in terms of, uh, in terms of general universal principles, uh, in many circles, even something like the common human nature is being called uh, into question, let alone any form of uh, moral... Um, uh, or human rights, for, for, for that matter, uh, are also uh, uh, called into question. And then a uh, third element, it would seem to me, at least that in some circles, democracy is no longer perceived as a, as a moral ideal, but is understood simply as a to tool of governance. Tool is rusty right now, isn't uh, up to dealing with complex issues because people are not sufficiently educated, enlightened. Uh, we need different kinds of tools. So those would be 
all indicators of a possible crisis. And I would be interested to know what you uh, what you think about some of these uh, things. And many of our uh, listeners and uh, uh, readers, people who are con- connected with the center, they, they they had something of that in mind. The, the, those features and problems of, of democracy, and would be very glad to hear w- what you think about it. Yes. See, I think the third thing, the the fact that democracy doesn't work, which is what Xi Jinping is saying, that's not the real problem. Though if people come to believe it, it becomes a real problem. Yeah. I think what is paralyzing us is precisely the common identities we all need in any given society, because two versions of them, as it were, separate out. And they separate out in stories. I mean, one is usually one turn towards the past. We had a wonderful society back at some time, a tea party right back in 1774, but this in the past, and we're losing it. And the other is, uh, in the American case, the Obama slogan that uh, we're making a more perfect union. It's future-oriented. And there are these big differences in the readings of it. And now because the common identity is so important, when we differ about that, we get very, very excited. And we can easily get to the point where we think we have to win, whatever the cost, right? Because otherwise, the identity will be, you know, will be, <clears throat> will be scrapped. And I think that is one of the, the reasons. Now, if you get uh, go a bit deeper in America, in France, in a number of other places, you see this terrible demographic fear that what we consider the standard Frenchman, American, whatever, is going to be engulfed. In the United States, it does take, among other forms, the form of white minoritization. There's a sense that in 2040, there will be a minority of white European or Anglo-Saxon. And some people face that with real anguish. In the French case, the same thing is going on. The idea of who will, the idea of being replaced. There's a Frenchman who wrote a book about, you know, the remplacé, being replaced by Muslims. Yeah. Or at the in the famous Charlottesville or infamous Charlottesville slogan, Jews cannot replace us. Now it's that fear of replacement which brings about the greatest degree of anxiety and the greatest degree of desperation, of frankly cheating. I mean, the immense desire of so many American Republicans to suppress the votes of minorities, right? including going to ridiculous lengths of the kind of legislation they're passing. And there's no absolutely, virtually zero danger of cheating. They're making all these rules to make it more difficult for people with low income to, to, to vote. You know, they have only a certain number of uh, places you can deposit your ballot, only a certain number of hours. If you have to work eight hours, and you're not going to be compensated. You're have to rush to the polls, and if there's the slightest glitch, you won't get there. So there, people go to lengths that are absolutely so counter-democratic, and they're unanimous in defending these. Unfortunately, the Trump, now Trump, reframed Supreme Court, but that was even, even before. Roberts, whom I had some respect for, and do still, when it came to striking down plainly discriminatory voting legislation, he failed to do it. And they once more did this uh, very recently. So you get really, in the end, a kind of desperation around being replaced. So the same thing exists in the fear in Poland that some kind of liberal homosexual liberties <laughs> will take over what they think is integral Catholicism. The fear in Hungary that Hungarian Christian civilization, whatever that is, is going to be taken over. Uh, there is this fear of being replaced, which is very, very profound. Hmm. Now, there's only one way to get over that. It's to create enough of a coalition between people on that side and people on the <clears throat> other side, on the side that I identify with, because uh, there are people really suffering on that other side, particularly in the United States when they've been denied good health care and so on. 
and some of them can ally with um, people on the Democratic side, speak in party terms, and create a new a new consensus, a new majority consensus. And of course, the 18th century constitution of the United States is very dysfunctional. There's a little bit of an obstacle to that, but I think you can see it happening. Another source of hope for me is the response to um, the death of George, the murder of George Floyd, where you had an immense number of younger people turning out with great multiracial demonstrations. So that although people who are afraid of the whites becoming a minority are rather galvanized on the other side, and, and Trump tried to appeal to them, and the generations succeeding them, there's some hope that you can recreate a kind of consensus uh, in which there isn't this paralyzing fear and the sense that we're going to stop it and <clears throat> we're going to be replaced and destroyed and so on, but on the contrary, we can reach some kind of understanding. And I think that's the path of hope that exists in, in democracies, but it's very narrow <laughs> and it's being, you know, ups, all sorts of obstacles are being thrown up. I mean, for instance, the U.S. Congress can't pass a decent voting rights law, and the Supreme Court won't uh, not help it. And so we, it's, it's hanging on the knife edge in a certain sense. But, <clears throat> but I think a possible way forward can be discerned. Part of your diagnosis there reminded me of a question that Peng Yin, an ethicist down at Emory, submitted and hoped that we might ask you. He connects the sort of diagnosis you're giving with your concept of uh, social imaginary, mm-hmm. Peng asks. In a secular age, you described a rather uplifting modern social imaginary. Society is a realm of mutual benefits where our purposes mesh. In the present moment, however, society is increasingly seen in conflictual terms as no more than a theater of competing interests. Has that social imaginary you captured more than a decade ago vanished in our current crisis of democracy? If so, do you see any prospect for its recovery? Yeah, but I mean, it hasn't vanished, but it's split. You see, the thing is that it's, we're not dealing simply with a conflict of interests. I mean, there are lots of interests. And there are lots of, of people, of forces intervening purely out of interest. And so the Republicans in the States are supported by the oil lobby and the oil lobby is interested in money for the oil. <laughs> that's, that's the end of it. Their cultural interest is zero, except that they, that they can instrumentalize this kind of cultural thing. But, but the powerful thing is people who really believe strongly in an American identity, which is defined in terms of the kind of white boss culture that originally animated it and which sees blacks and Hispanics and people from outside of other cultures is not really properly uh, integrated into this and therefore fears that this, this ethic will be lost. It's, it's a very powerful conflict between ethical views. You see? The social imaginary always is ethically tinged. It's, what, what we're, it's, it's our project in common, which we have to think of as something important. But it splits at, this, at certain points. And very profound fears of replacement and so on or driving driving the split. So the it's not a matter of reconciling interests here. It's a matter of getting a bridge across these different prescriptions. And the hope for that is always that there's another generation. If you had people of a certain, you know, Republicans of a certain age in the West or the Red States, or whatever you want to call it, are probably um, not, uh, you know, can't be recruited to this, <laughs> this project of remaking society. But there's some indication that new populations, young populations, and a higher vote among, you know, uh, among non hegemonic uh, demographics could reproduce a majority of the it could begin to recreate a consensus. It seems like there's a lot of institutional 
and then in party polarization, I, I'm speaking mainly from the U.S. context here. I, I don't quite know what polarization is looking like around the world. Here's a question from one of our listeners, Lynette Roth over Twitter. In a polarized world where the divisions are falling along religious lines and the religions are black and white, take no prisoners, how is democracy, where every voice counts, possible? Oh, well, if they get really entrenched, then people will, as I say, use all means, including anti-democratic means, to avoid being defeated, to avoid being put in a minority. <clears throat> and then you're just getting, getting worse and worse, in which the indignation of the other side <clears throat> gets greater and, and the thing spirals downward. But what's, what's interesting, of course, is that uh, the religious groups are split. I mean, you know, Joe Biden is a very, uh, I think, deeply pious Catholic of a certain kind. <laughs> I don't know if I'm with a bit more than, than some of his opponents, right? And so the, what we were talking about earlier, the subject we were talking about earlier is recurring here, that church communities, religious communities, or religious denominations, whatever you want, are split with their understanding of what it's, what it's all about. And it's very much the ones who have the same kind of fear. It's that fear of we are going to disappear. Fear that our understanding of what Christianity is, is disappearing from the, from the earth. That leads to uh, this very strange alliance of the desperate. I mean, just think 50, 100 and denominations weren't very kind to each other. Uh, particularly, you know, Christians and Jews and so on. But now you, if you find something very interesting on both sides, there are alliances of Christian conservatives, Jewish conservatives, uh, Catholic and Protestant conservatives, and on the other side, an alliance of people of that other, uh, take this other view about the secular age that, that I would like to <laughs> to press forward. Well, given, given the centrality of fear, in in the diagnosis you've been giving, as a Christian seeking Christianly, I think second only to follow me uh, in the Gospels is the command, "Do not be afraid." Yeah. Uh, do you have kind of any hortatory words to to say to other Christians who might feel some of that fear, who might who might be thinking, uh, looking at say church decline numbers in the United States, and have a kind of religiously inflected worry? that then ramifies in these political directions. Yeah, that this is not the end of Christianity. The arrival of the secular age is a new phase in the realization and penetration of the Christian faith into the world in which we, in which we live. There are all sorts of ways in which Christ and the love of God is present in our society. This space is being filled with, the, the Christian message in, in, in different forms, this is not the end of a story or not, let's say, the danger of a total end of the story unless we fight back very strongly and, and uh, beat down the other guys. I think be not afraid. That's one of the great things that John Paul <laughs> gave us. It's, yeah, very definitely. Be not afraid is the, is the call. But the fear is so gripping at the moment for many of those people that one fears they can't listen. Biggest hope is that their children can. Their children will not just be driven away by this narrowness, which could happen, but will be somehow moved by the spirit enough to find another, another path, another path, another path, and the faith lives again. I mean, one needs a kind of hope. Uh, that's that's maybe the in a certain sense the uh, evangelical virtue that, <laughs> that we need now is is one of the hope. Friends, thanks for joining us. Whether it's your first time listening to For the Life of the World or you're a long time listener, we're grateful that you're here. We drop new episodes every Saturday and would be honored if you'd subscribe to the show and leave us a rating and comment in Apple Podcasts. We'll be back with part two of our conversation with Charles Taylor next week.
For the Life of the World is a production of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture at Yale Divinity School. This episode featured philosopher Charles Taylor and theologians Miroslav Wolf and Ryan McAnally Linz. Production assistance by Martin Chan and Nathan Jowers. I'm Evan Rosa and I edited and produced the show. For more information, visit us online at faith.yale.edu. New episodes drop every Saturday with the occasional midweek. If you're new to the show, we're so glad that you found us. Remember to hit subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. And if you've been listening for a while, thank you, friends. If you're liking what you're hearing, I've got a request. Would you support us? It's pretty simple, really, and won't take much time. Here are some ideas. First, you could hit the share button for this episode in your app and send a text or email to a friend or share it to your social feed. Second, you could give us an honest rating on Apple Podcasts. How are we really doing? Finally, you could write a short review of the show in Apple Podcasts. Reviews are cool because they'll help like-minded people get an idea for what we're all about and what's most meaningful to you, our listeners. Thanks for listening today, friends. We'll be back with more this coming week.